Tim, I want to welcome you back to FACE. How are you? Hey, hey Dan, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. You? Good. Doing okay, Tim. So uh, macrodegiac almost sounds like aphrodisiac. Was that the a play on words for uh, for you got for you with your handle? It definitely was. It definitely was. Yeah, it was supposed to be a love a love of macro. It was, uh, it was oh, somewhere. Oh, okay, in. beautiful. All right. Well, you know, I like telescopes. Uh, I think a lot of people get um, carried away with their microscope, get too short term. So, uh, if you recall <laughs> how to how to share a screen, we could take a look at what you have on your radar, and if anything's changed since our last uh, conversation. So, okay, a new way to visualize uh, the surge in COVID. What yeah, this is just. It's, just, it's something that I'm I'm noticing a lot that uh, is something we've been talking about is this the sort of potential for policymakers to to uh, to kind of not not evolve with the times, you know, when we're looking at these these sort of case numbers and everything here, and we're seeing the things that have been reported and some of the things that are coming up in the in the press conferences, they're still very heavily focused on the cases, as if that's the thing that they're gonna they're gonna respond to. You know, and obviously I know it's quite, it seems to be quite political in the US, especially um, yes. as the vaccination, you know, who's, who's right. vaccinated, which party they're affiliated with and everything else. But then when you, uh, when you go across to some of the data that's been around lately that I've got here, okay, I'll take this from the, from the FT piece recently, you see the way, I think this one actually shows it the best, I think this was. Oh yeah, I think I saw that other one, uh, retweeted it. The one this before one. this, yeah, 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 that's it. You know, you see, you see the the difference that that we need to sort of look at now. I think is is obviously the fact that we're moving into a new a sort of a new regime within the virus itself. Um, obviously, we're seeing now that the uh, it's, it's more about hospitalisation, it's more about deaths. Um, you know, and that the vaccination doesn't stop people from catching COVID. You know, that's that's the big thing that we're sort of seeing. It doesn't stop it at all. It's it's not intended to. Um, and there's a risk that obviously policymakers are going to overreact to this, you know, and start putting in lockdowns again. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty around, I think. You know, you, well, you know, isn't that Australia too the only co uh, country so mm -hmm. far? Uh, except I heard that China went into lockdown. But yeah, I think uh, one of their cities, just one of their cities again. OK, they're always in, I mean, that's not a new, you know, their whole country's locked down by their political mm -hmm. party. So, um yeah. Uh, you think it could be a policy error here? Yeah, I, th some... I think definitely. I think there's the potential for some some governments to overreact to case numbers um, and not not necessarily put us back into lockdowns, but just make everything drag more. You know, Australia is obviously the exception because they they just you know they they took laid back to a whole new uh, <laughs> a whole new level there with their uh, their approach to getting the vaccines. So. Um, but yeah, I do. I really think that that's, that's a potential there. You've seen the coverage of it and they're, you know, policymakers are worried about things. But in the background, a couple of things are happening. We saw Italy. Italy have extended their state of emergency until the end of the year. But they're not wow. now. Um, yeah, but they've, they've, le they've linked the restrictions to hospitalizations rather than actually linking them to the case numbers. So it's kind of, uh, it is an evolution, but it didn't really get much coverage. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, Australia, you know, we're one of the things we're we're looking at in particular is uh, is obviously just into into sorry, I've got the, the pound dollar chart there, get the GDP yeah. AUD, is is the potential for another vaccine trade. We had on last time, I think actually around the last time I came on, we, we played the, the euro against the pound for uh, for the sort of relative vaccination rate trade. Um, and now we're looking at pound Aussie for exactly that same uh, that same trade and it's, it's obviously you can see it's broken out here on the on the daily chart just at this area oh, here you know it's yeah i think it's it's one of those a lot of these crosses kind of go under the radar all the time but at the moment with the risk environment we're in um it makes sense to potentially play you know some of the among the g10 should we say you know the higher beta currencies against each other along other yeah. lines rather than playing sort of you know aussie yen for example is a you know the classic risk on risk off but yeah. you know, I had a little dabble in that earlier today, and it didn't it didn't go well. So, uh... <laughs> what? But what a creative approach to uh, you know. Uh, you're the first one I've uh, talked to about you know, kind of uh, singling out countries and policies and uh, based on COVID response. Meaning, you know, the ones with a more serious response are going to have less economic growth compared to the ones that 
do not have draconian measures in place. A very creative way to look at uh, FX. Yeah, I think I, I think you kind of thank you, thank you, and I think we you come we're kind of forced into it a little bit as well because there's there's no real sort of there's no real monetary policy differentials to play off against each other now. So you've got to look at the uh, at the fiscal environment and the economic environment a bit more than you traditionally would because there isn't yeah there just isn't the interest rate differential at the moment. Okay, well you know there's some talk uh, uh, among our team today you know with the Fed meeting this week that maybe they could. Uh take advantage of, uh, you know, a, a bit of the overreaction to mm -hmm. what's happening with uh, the Delta variant and, um, you know, kind of build its case for staying uh, dovish longer. Uh, yeah, what are your I, expectations I, from the Fed? Absolutely. I think that's, that's going to be, they're certainly not going to be any more hawkish than they were perceived last time. That's for sure. Um, because I think really last time, if you actually listened to particularly Powell's comments, in the press conference afterwards, he wasn't really saying that much that was any different to prior press conferences. There was a couple of things that were sort of, you know, slightly more optimistic because obviously things had, things had progressed. But, you know, there was still a lot of focus on unemployment and, you know, there was still, he's still very much in the transitory camp as far as uh, inflation goes. But I think really the dots were, the dots stole the show last time. And obviously okay. they're, they're, they're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, as we all are at the moment, about the future path of everything. So yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very like difficult. It. No, I don't like it either. I don't like yeah. it. It's, it's tough yeah. to hold it, to hold on to anything at all. It's hard to be uh, positive. Yeah, very, very. Yeah, I mean, really tell you know, I guess you don't know if you have faith till you need it. <laughs> I guess not. Right, yeah. buddy? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you could say, oh, gosh, I have, you know, I have strong faith. And then you have a little crisis and you're going, mom. Mom. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, markets, yeah. that that's pretty interesting. Uh, the way you're looking at uh, this, so um, you just see a continuation of uh, you know this inflation debate, transient, sticky. Um, you have any uh, feel on yields? I I seem uh, yeah. last week's action in the ten year looks like it may have ended. The recent fall in yields at the 113 level, uh, you have a uh, you know that's a big debate here. Uh, what what's the next move in yields? Well, you know from 178 it was down, but I'm thinking from here we start heading up over time. You have uh, any feel um, for that? Uh, yes and no. That, again, I'm I'm very very conflicted at the moment with a lot of things that are that are going on. I'm um, we've been having a chat. At Macrodesiac about about what's actually been driving the yields and sort of how much actually can be how much sorry should I say shouldn't be attributed to the inflation uh, side of the story and perhaps how much should be attributed more to the China slowdown and more recently these China this China regulations that have been uh, weighing on everything particularly overnight um, you know it's kind of it's there's a uh, we're wondering sort of more whether the bonds are, it's the it's the flights to safety the flights to quality. Um, yeah. that's actually driving it more than the inflation story, or at least as much as uh, the inflation story. Good so it, it does, it looks to me like the, there's, there's still a, a decent camp of people that want to move into the kind of cyclical um, part of the cycle. You know, they want to move on now from this initial sort of recovery phase into, into expansion. They want to get into, into the, next, the next sort of um, phase of growth. But I think there's right. still just potentially too much there's a lot of factors that still need to be resolved before you can, again, before you can do that with any degree of confidence, I think. So I, I think yields are probably going to be choppy. I don't know that we'll see much lower than we're currently, than we have seen now, um, unless we get a real bout of, of sudden risk aversion again. Um, but at the same time, I'm not expecting them to shoot up to, you know, the 10 year up to 2% this year or anything else. I just think we're going to, okay. we're going to have a lot of full starts. Unfortunately, I feel that feels to me like, like the way things are going to go, you know, with, with the virus, with supply chains, with, you know, we're still going to get some of the inflation story. Now it's been used cars recently. You know, that, that's obviously, yeah. uh, that, that I never thought, I never yeah. thought that would happen. No, it's crazy, but it just shows how you can't trust the data. You've got to dig into the data. Um, you know, really try and look beyond, you know, underneath it rather than just trying to say, oh, inflation is going up, therefore, or this is happening, therefore, you've got to look beyond that, the sort of second order, third, third order consequences, what's going on underneath. You know, for, like, for example, now the next sort of thing, now used cars looks like it's probably going to resolve itself. You know, the, the chips are coming back on as well. So new car supply is going to come back online. 
um, you know, there's going to that will move out of it. But now we're going to move on to the rental side of things. You know, the owner equivalent rents, that's going to be a, a key part of the inflation picture now, how much people are paying to rent property. Um, and again, right. there's a lot of people that are drawing a correlation between uh, the price of houses, which has obviously gone up exponentially during the whole crisis, and, um, and what rental prices will be. And there has definitely been an increase in what people are asking for rents. But at the same time, I don't think rents are necessarily linked um, to the housing prices. I think they're more linked to wage prices. You know, obviously, the more you can earn, the, the more you pay in rent. And especially now you've potentially got more of an option to, uh, to work remotely. You know, why, why would you stick around somewhere necessarily where you've got to pay a fortune for rent if you can go and work remotely somewhere else? True. Okay. So, yeah, I'm getting a question and a little bit of a debate from a few of our attendees. With such low yields, Tim, how do you explain that gold is not rallying? What's this right. going on? If I'm completely honest, I can't. All right. You don't know. All right. It's puzzled. I've got the chart. I've got the chart right here. Okay. Let's have a look. Okay. There. Yeah. You can see that there on the screen. So what yeah. I've done there. Okay. So you get your, your real yield um, right. up there. Right. And you've got your gold price here. So in theory, as we saw over, over here. All right. right. At this kind of level of, of negative yields, negative real yields, gold should be much higher, but it's not. Okay. Now that, that kind of says to me that we're not, you know, because gold obviously is it's a hedge against you know negative real yields. It's a hedge against negative nominal yields as well. It's somewhere to put. It's a zero yielding asset. Somewhere to put money that's just going to, roughly speaking, hold value. That's the general idea. So I can't really explain why this is broken down here, other than the idea that perhaps people are expecting the orange line to come back down. That we're going to get these higher yields again at some point, and yields will go less negative. That's all that I can think to explain it. Because if we're really moving into a, a a low inflation, low growth environment, then gold should be higher. Okay. And uh, the recent, uh, we've had some pretty volatile action after a sustained bull move in WTI. Mm. And it came off about, I don't know, $10, $12 from the high. And then yeah. recovered uh, more than half in a matter of days, um, but still not making a higher high. This could be the second lower high. Uh, yeah. Where do you come down on energy? Um, I I think that what we've what we've got at the moment again again is very very messy. But you know potentially we've got an undersupplied market in the short term. Um, then we've got potentially a, an oversupplied market next year. Perhaps as all of the uh, if they try and bring back all of their pre um, pre COVID production next year, which is currently the plan throughout 2022. Um, but then beyond that, it's it's a case our energy needs to keep on going up. You know, we, um, this sort of the idea of this energy transition, I think it's, it's again, people get, uh, you've got to really zoom out with it and look and see what are the alternatives that are going to replace oil over a, a short time frame. Um, and then they're, they're not really scalable yet to get that, that amount of power online quickly enough um, that we're probably, that we're not going to see higher energy prices, I think, going forward in the short term. Uh, especially while everyone's so averse to nuclear, which, you know, in terms of the policy making circles, which is, it just still amazes me, really. There's, so, there's some really fabulous things going on with nuclear fusion now. They think they might have actually solved the science side of it um, with these sort of with these high powered magnets. So it looks like nuclear fusion could be very safe and could be could give us almost an abundance of energy that we never dreamed of. Um, and really uh, uranium. Now yeah, uranium, yeah. And there was, um, what's the other one? Oh, I always forget this one. It's kind of, it hasn't been spoken about much. I think it's thorium, if I remember rightly. Okay. It's another, yeah, it's another type that I was, I was reading about recently. I'm not, I don't profess to be, to be an expert in any of these things. I just sort of try right. and dip a finger in a lot of pies to get a good idea of what the overall playing field is. Okay. How about the playing field? Uh, I thought it was uh, remarkable how we had a reversal week the week before and stock indexes came in sharply lower and then made new highs by the end of the week, uh, um, becoming, you know, parabolic. Uh, I, I thought we'd have a, a retracement move off that break, but um, here we are at new highs. So just continue this uh, continuation of this uh, bull market that will not uh cave we haven't had a five percent correction and i don't i think i was reading 14 months or something like that uh yeah that sounds about right and and yeah again it's it's you know it's a shortage of good of good quality assets you know so what we always see is we see especially when you know it's 
I suppose if you think about the the big tech stocks, which are obviously the ones that are most heavily weighted in 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 the Nasdaq and the S and P, and leading um, the way, and leading the way, yeah, you know they they are <clears throat> just somewhere that you can always put money when again you've got low yielding bonds and everything else there. They're the ones that are driving the earnings. They're the ones that are driving pretty much everything. Um, you know, and if you don't want to put your money into bonds, then which stocks do you go to? Well, you always go to those first. And obviously, they're heavily weighted in the indices. So obviously, indices are going to keep on are going to keep on going higher. I think there is the potential um, at some point once we once we kind of muddle through this next period, where you know there's been a lot of talk about moving into the mid cycle. All right, so transitioning into the mid cycle. I think Morgan Stanley have been talking about this for two or three, maybe a bit longer than two or three months now. Um, you know, perhaps we move more into you know capex and 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 that that area of sort of spending, and the growth will come in other in other stocks. And obviously, the high weighting might work against the indices there for a little while. Um, Morgan Stanley are actually talking about a ten to twenty percent pullback on on that. I'm not sure that we'll get that deep, to be honest. I think buy the dip is so ingrained. Now, uh, and even even a five percent dip looks like a gift. So, uh, yeah, I don't I don't yeah. really see us. I, I again, I don't see anything because it's just the shortage of assets. You know, where else do you put your money? It's it's a constant question. No one no one can offer another answer for. I mean, you can't even put it in China at the moment. <laughs> you know, because you're yeah, just going to lose money. Can, can we really have it both ways? I remember back in two thousand eight, well, and and nine when we were going through the housing crisis mm -hmm. um china wasn't europe was uh, europe was affected by what happened here we were the epicenter um and the talk was you know china's still growing uh, they're going to help pull us out of this recession because they still have growth mm -hmm. so uh can we have it both ways where uh you know uh, china is not leading the way now and there are a lot of draconian things uh happening there with uh stocks and lending and credit and if china could pull us out of an economic malaise could it pull us into one yeah i mean <laughs> arguably now the boots on the other foot now isn't it you know china yeah. actually needs needs the west to pull them out of economic malaise really they you know that <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that goes on with their numbers as we all know that they're yeah. not to be relied on but their their economy isn't strong um, you know, across the across the board, and they're really struggling to get their consumption up as well. They're trying to move to that uh, dual circulation economy. Yeah, that handoff that handoff didn't really um, happen, did it? With uh, no. from being an export economy to being a consumer led economy. No, not at all, not at all. So okay. I think they actually, yeah, I don't, they're definitely not going to be the ones to pull us out of it. And like you say, they may well they may well end us end up pulling us into it. Because um, yeah. you, you know, look at charts it, from, uh, you know. FXI and some of the Asian markets, uh, it's night and day compared to the U.S. markets. Yeah, completely, completely. I mean, in some of these education stocks, they're down like 70, 80 percent in a matter of days. Well, if you, OK, well, that's an education. Yeah, yeah. Certainly For anyone was, who bought yeah. those, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. risk, that, that's an expensive one. Not that I have never experienced it. Uh, I, I know it's expensive because I have experienced it. So, um Really appreciate you coming in and uh, sharing your views. Uh, I, I think very creative of, uh, you know, using what's happening in the world to uh, construct of FX trades. And, uh, you know, it, another great interview. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. And uh, why don't you show people uh, your website, if you like, and how they could follow you. I see you have uh, some type of free newsletter yeah, yep. uh, you're with you're with Peter Bell. You guys are partners. Correct? David, David Bell. David Bell. David okay. Bell. Yes. Okay. You're with David, yeah. and there you go. Yeah, that's Marketing. it. So you find us at that's it macrodesiac.com um, or at macrodesiac on uh, on Twitter as well. Or you can follow David. Um, David, you can find him at, at David Bell, and I'm at Volatim. Tim, thank you so much, my trading warrior your brother, for coming in, and uh, um, I, you know. Uh, I've only talked to you, interviewed you a couple times, but I learn from you each time. And Likewise. I, Thank you, I, I Thank appreciate you. you edifying our face community here today, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Pleasure. Okay. Okay, everyone, that's a wrap. Uh, we'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Good trading. You're welcome, Ingmar. People are thanking us, uh, Tim, for the interview. Excellent. And remember, don't just count your uh, Thanks, guys. viruses count your blessings so <laughs> anyway <laughs> guys i'll see <laughs> i'll see everyone tomorrow thank you Cheers, guys all Bye. right see you tim 
Adios.